part, I'm going to talk about the different microscope systems that are available for imaging in terms of which to use, um, confocal versus deconvolution or wide field. In the third part, I'll talk about the actual microscope systems that are available to you in the bioimaging facility, the different types and the range of systems that we have. But this is more of an overview of um, how fluorescence works and what systems to, to use for the, um, the different samples that you might have. So the first thing to understand is how fluorescence actually works. So we'll always keep coming back to this idea that we're working in the visible part of the spectrum. So you have to kind of remember that down in the short wavelength has high energy and up in the um, long wavelength is lower energy. So that, that'll keep coming back time and again when we talk about things. So how fluorescence actually works is to do with the electrons moving between different energy levels. So initially, the electron resides in the ground state, a stable um, ground state, and a photon of light comes into the fluorophore. So it's short wavelength, which has high energy, and excites that electron up to one of the higher energy, higher energy levels. It's not able to stay here too long. It starts to vibrate, loses energy, and starts to relax, and eventually it'll drop back down to the ground state, and that change in energy there will be emitted as another photon of light. But because it's lost energy, it moves to a longer wavelength. So we had blue light coming in, and it might be green light coming out, this lower energy. There can be a whole range of these excitation relaxations, which gives you the characteristic excitation profile of a dye and the characteristic emission profile of the dye. And that's really what we're interested in when you come down to the bioimaging facility. We'll ask you what dyes you're using. Um, we don't really care if it's called Jojo 1 or anything like that. We're more interested in its excitation profile and the emission profiles to make sure that we can image it on one of our microscopes and make sure you're using the best filter sets for your, your dye. Something that you have to remember is this isn't the only way that light energy can return back to the ground state. So you're hoping when you're imaging using a fluorescent sample that you're exciting your fluorophore and it's emitting light and that should be able to happen indefinitely so you, you're always able to see a nice bright sample down the microscope. When you talk about bleaching your sample, what's actually happening is this excitation of the electron still happening, your fluorophore is still present on your sample, it's now returning back to the ground state via this triplet state, which means the electron is returning to the ground state non-radiatively. So you don't actually get light emitted from your sample. So over time, What's actually happening, it just dims down because we're moving from this emission state to this non-emission state. So it's really important that you use good antifades or bright photostable, sam photostable samples so that that process happens more often than anything else that's going that way. So if we're looking at our microscopes, the transmitted light that you might use on um, for, for bright field imaging, the tissue culture microscopes and things like that, you've actually got the light transmitted through the sample and up to your eyes or your, your camera. In fluorescence, we tend to use epifluorescence. So we have a light source where the light goes down, bounces through this special set of mirrors and filters down to your sample. At your sample, it then fluoresces and that light travels back up through the same objective, but this time passes through and goes onto your eyes or your camera. So on a microscope, there's really two critical parts to it. Your objective, which is gonna do the imaging, and this dichroic mirror um, filter cube, which is gonna choose what light goes where. So we need to work with both of these components. So the filter cube is actually composed normally in, in simple um, snapshot systems of three components, an excitation filter, a dichroic mirror, and an emission filter. And they work together. 
So we have maybe a, a, a strong white light source, which is producing the full spectrum, and it hits that first mirror. And that mirror will only let light of a certain wavelength through. So in this case, it's letting light between 450 and 500 nanometers through. So past that first mirror, all we see is blue light. That hits this 45 degree mirror, and its optical properties mean that in the blue portion of the spectrum, its percentage of transmission is effectively zero. So that mirror acts like a mirror, um, that dichroic mirror acts like a mirror and reflects the light down out of your objective to your sample. Your sample's fluorophore absorbs that blue light, emits green light, which is then collected by the objective and taken back up to this dichroic mirror. Now we're in the green portion of the spectrum. The percentage transmission now is effectively 100%. So this acts like a piece of glass and the light can pass through there towards your eye. And we have the final emissions filter, which is gonna clean it up to make sure that the stray light and other things that are glowing down the microscope don't, um, don't appear in your camera or your, your eyes. So these three components work together to form the filter cube to image your specific um, dyes. And we can work with that. And there can be a whole range of different filters which will let through different portions of the spectrum. And we need to make sure that our dye works well with our filter cube. So if we look at um, a dye with a particular excitation and emission profile, and we look at the filter cubes that we're looking at, this is the excitation filter. So we can see that we hit the excitation maxima of our um, fluorophore. So it's gonna glow as well as it possibly could do. The red line is the emission spectra, the emission filter. So you can see that, whoops, all of this light from the emission gets collected through that filter. So we're exciting our dye optimally, and we're collecting all of its emitted light. So that's about as good a filter cube as you could possibly use. If we use the different dye through that same filter set, you can see now we're only exciting that dye to about 40% of its maxima. So it's gonna look dim, even though we're still collecting all of its emission spectra through that filter, it was dim to begin with, so it's gonna look pretty poor signal. So you might look down that microscope and think your sample hasn't been very well labeled and think, I've got to put more antibody on for next time, where actually your sample might be really bright, we're just not illuminating it optimally. So your dye doesn't look very good down the microscope. So you can work with some websites to make sure that you're using the right filters with the right dyes. So a really good website is Semrock Searchlight. And in here, you can say what dye you're wanting to use. So you might be using Alexa 488. You can ask it to show you the emission and excitation profile of these dyes. So you can see each one at a time. And then we can see how well that works through different filter sets and with different lasers. So we might be using the um, a Fitzy Basic. And you can see here now, if we take away the, um, the dichroic, we're exciting the dye quite well, and we're collecting its light nicely through that filter set. The other website that we can use is the Bioimaging Intranet. So if we go to the core research facilities, bioimaging, equipment and services, the snapshots. Down here, we can see exactly which filter sets and what filters we have in each position on the filter wheel. So we can use that information back in Searchlight to make sure that our filters work well with the dyes that we're using. So they're really good ways of um, making sure that you're using the best system and the best dye. Again, if it doesn't make sense, please come down and speak to one of the bioimaging staff because we're happy to go through sample prep because it makes a huge difference 
to the quality of the images that you're going to acquire if you're using the right filters and the right dyes in combination. The other part that's really important on the microscope is the objective. So an objective isn't just a big solid piece of glass, it's actually a whole series of lenses inside it. Because when you pass light through an optical surface, you get the refraction of the light. So greens and reds and blues are refracted to different amounts. So if you're wanting to do multicolor imaging, you need to make sure that those are corrected so that they come back into alignment. So sometimes you have objective components that are trying to correct for the objective components in front of it, making it a more and more complicated um, optical setup, which then often makes it more and more expensive objective. But you pretty much get what you pay for. The objective is there to try and tell you what it wants. So if you look at the, um, the objective focusing on a point source of, of light within your sample, actually what you're trying you're recreating is an enlarged version of it that's how you get the microscope magnification but every optical surface that it passes through with a different refractive index is going to refract that light and mangle the image if you get those things wrong so the objective is giving you an indication of what it wants you to do for it you're trying to keep as similar refractive index through the system as possible. So often mounting media has a refractive index which is close to glass so that you don't get a big um, refraction of the light as it moves from one media to the next. Cover slip thickness, which I covered in the first seminar, is really, really important. If the objective says it needs a 0.17 millimeter cover slip, the thickness of that cover slip must be 0.17 millimeters, which is a number 1.5. Anything else, and it's gonna be like using a different pair of glasses to try and see something. If it says oil, it wants oil. If it doesn't say oil, it doesn't want oil. So some people think that oil makes things better. It only makes it better if the objective was expecting it in the first place. Otherwise, it just makes it a lot worse. So have a look at that. The other thing that people notice is it says plan apo or, or something like that. That's talking about the kind of objective, how it's corrected for a flat field of vision, corrected for different wavelengths to be aligned a back in um, to co-localization. So often what people think of when you talk about objectives is just the magnification. They want to use a time 60 objective, Whoa, a big image, and then they see this number afterwards and they go, mm, no idea what that is. Actually, this is the numerical aperture and this number after the magnification is actually more important than the magnification itself. So you can think of numerical aperture in two ways. The first one is the light gathering ability of the objective. Okay. So when you shine a light onto a point source in your sample, unfortunately, it doesn't just go back the way it was illuminated. It emits light in all directions. So how much of that light actually gets collected back into the objective? That angle there is... Um, the, the angle of incidence from your point source back up through the, the lens. And because we can have different immersion liquids between your sample and the objective, we can have a refractive index above one by using the oil, which then allows you to have a high numerical aperture. The more light from this cone that we can collect, the brighter your sample's gonna look. But the other thing that you have with numerical aperture is its resolving ability. How fine a structure can it resolve? So it's a little bit like thinking of how fine is the pen that you're using to draw the picture. So if you're using a low numerical aperture objective, it's like using a, a big fat marker pen. Whereas if you have a high numerical aperture, it's like having a very fine um, Stiblio marker pen. How does that become important? Imagine if we're looking at two structures very close together. 
we use a new a low numerical aperture lens. Blob blob. You can't resolve them as two structures. It just looks like one big blob down the microscope. Middle numerical aperture, you might hit a thing called the Riley criteria, where you can just make out that these two structures are two distinct um, circles rather than one big blob. But with a high numerical aperture, you're able to then resolve these down to see the very fine details in your sample. And you might think that's really obvious, but actually, you can go down a long way in resolution and still gain an image. So even though this, this image now has very little resolution in it, you can still see um, that it's a scary clown. You know, so it's the same thing using a low numerical aperture. You might be looking down the microscope and you can still see which cells are transfected, which are positive for a certain stain or anything like that. But you won't be able to see the kind of the really fine details such as the ruffling of the, the membranes or, or structures that are very close together down there. So you've got to kind of think what it is you're wanting to see down the microscope and making sure that you use the appropriate objectives to be able to resolve that in the first place. There's no point trying to do super resolution with a low numerical aperture lens. So going with that, what we find that most users think a microscope does when they come down to the facility, they can put their slides or their dishes into the most amazing, most expensive microscope and out of it is going to come publication quality data. Unfortunately, that's not quite how it works. If you come down with a crap sample, you're going to put it through our expensive microscope, which is going to do its best, but essentially it's still a crap picture and you've now acquired vast amounts of data trying to make it any better. What you really need to do is make sure when you come down to the microscope, your sample is good in the first place. If it's crap, go back, work on your sample prep and listen to the seminar from the, the first part again and make sure you're using the best antibodies, the best secondaries, the best cover slips, the best mountain to make sure that you've got the best chance of acquiring a good image on the microscopes. So what happens when we look down a microscope? If you're looking at a point source of light, what you actually have on any optical system, this point source gets blurred through Z. So you see this if you're on a, a tissue culture microscope and you're looking at a piece of debris floating around in it. When it's in focus, it looks small and diffuse, uh, small and, and high contrast. As you go out of focus, that same physical piece of debris starts to look bigger and bigger and more and more diffuse. You focus back onto it, goes smaller and smaller, higher, higher contrast, and then out the other side, big and diffuse again. So if we were going to cut through that in cross-section, you have this characteristic hourglass structure where in the focal plane, it's nice and small and tight and high contrast, and out of focus becomes big and diffuse. And that happens to point sources in fluorescence as well. So if we had a sample with lots of fluorescence through it, by the time we image that on the microscope, each point source is blurred through Z. And any plane that we then start to image has some in-focus light from it, but also the outer focus light from above and below the focal plane that we were interested in, basically degrading the overall quality of the image that we can achieve in that focal plane. So we have to come up with some sort of strategy to try and remove that outer focus light from our sample. One option, the classic option you might think of, is using a confocal microscope. Confocals are great for three-dimensional structures because what we do is we reject the outer focus light. And we'll cover that in more detail in a minute. Another strategy is deconvolution microscopy. And what we do here is we collect light from wherever it's ended up within the system and we reassign it back to its original position. So we actually increase the contrast of the signal using deconvolution. Another strategy is thin section 
or wide field. So rather than working with the full volume of the tissue, we can section that in the histology facility or in, in the lab or thin tissue culture cells that are already very flat. And there's very little out of focus light because when we focus on the sample, that's the only place that the light's gonna come from. So it's already all from the focal plane. So let's have a look at how a confocal works. And the main thing on a confocal, and you'll hear this talked about over and over again, is the confocal pinhole. So we need to understand how that's working. This is the focal plane that we're interested in looking at. And as we follow its light path up through the system, you can see it all comes back to focal, a, a conjugate focal point Oops. here, and then it can pass on and then be refocused onto the detector to form an image. On a regular confocal, the light coming out of the objective isn't only focused at the focal plane. There'll be light above and below the focal point, point will also get excited by that same laser. Each of these focal points have different intermediate focal points that then arrive at the detector as out of focus light. So you, you basically, that's a wide field system. But we had that point where all the light from the focal plane came back to focus. If we put a physical barrier in that plane, we reject the out of focus light and all of the light from the focal plane can still pass through there and go on to form an image. So this is our confocal imaging pinhole. And what we do is we then just move the sample up and down through this imaging plane to form a three-dimensional stack. Each slice is then free from blur. So how it works in, in, pr in, in practice is we need a really high light source, light, a high intensity light source. So we tend to use lasers, which are then passed through the dichroic onto two imaging mirrors <clears throat> to be focused down to a single spot on our image. At that point, light's absorbed and the, the fluorescence then um, emits light, this green light, then bounces instantly off the two mirrors, off the dichroic is reflected towards our detector, any out of focus light is rejected by the pinhole, we clean it up through an emission filter, and then it's detected on our detector. And traditionally, we'll use a photo multiplier because we get very, very little light back from a confocal. So we need to amplify this signal massively to make one dot's worth of image on our um, monitor. So one dot here becomes one dot there. These mirrors then move the spot by one point. Excitation, emission, the light then goes up, is amplified to build the next dot on the screen. And that goes repeatedly across our image, point by point, to make a single image. It will then move up a slice to create the next slice through the um, through the stack. So the frame rate is determined by how quickly we can move that single point of light across your sample. So a regular confocal can actually be quite a slow process, but it's a great tool because it allows us to stack up through the image each slice free from blur so we can get the three-dimensional information through that sample. Once we've acquired the free from blur sample through the stack, we can then put that into a, the, the com computer and we now have X, Y, Z information, which then allows you to sort of play with that volume in three dimensions and we can put it into imaging software, we can create isosurface renders so that we can go in and really have a look at this structure and get an idea of its, its three-dimensional um, structures and how that interacts with other proteins in the, in, the, um, in the cell. But you've got to remember that everything we're doing isn't fixed and dead. If you had to take a picture of a motorway, it really doesn't tell you very much about what's going on. 
you get no idea of the dynamics or the directionality um, that's going on in the sample. It's only when you start to watch an actual movie that you get the idea of of the context, the, the speeds, the directions, and the interaction between the different um, parts of the cell. And the same thing happens with cells. We can fix cells, we can put them on the comfort, we can do Z stacks, but if we do that on fixed tissue, we're only ever looking at a snapshot of what was going on. Ideally, you want to be able to watch live cells, because it's only when you see the cells in their dynamic sense that you get the idea of really what's going on in them. You get this beautiful idea of cells with directionality, the, the protein dynamics going on in the, in the sample. So to do that we often have to have something that can acquire images at high frame speed. Either a point scanning confocal running very quickly or something like the spinning disk which rather than a single pinhole has hundreds of pinholes so that we can image hundreds of beams simultaneously and because there's hundreds of beams we can image very quickly onto a very sensitive camera. So this is actually what it looks like down the microscope. This is a spinning disc wheel that's been stopped so that you can see each of the individual pinholes that we, we have. These are then spun at high speed so this is now starting to spin the disc and the wheels are spinning so fast that you can't actually see the, the, the pinholes anymore. We're creating a, a kind of an image in one frame, um, which is actually still the pinholes rejecting all of the out of focus light. It just happens so quickly that it looks as if it's a, a normal snapshot image. But that image is now free from blur because we've rejected the out of focus light through each one of those pinholes. Once you have that, you can then image different colours um, down, down the microscope. Oh, you can't play the media, but um, you saw this in, in the previous um, webinar where we can actually follow through a living cell the green and the red proteins moving in a over time. Another strategy is to say well if I'm imaging through the sample I need to illuminate the whole sample but I'm only wanting to collect the light from a certain um, slice so I need to pass my sample all that way. There's a huge amount of phototoxicity associated with that even though I'm going to reject all of the light apart from that through my optical slice. That's a lot of cell damage. Another way that we can do it is to actually illuminate along the axis but collect the light orthogonally through it. So this is how a, a lattice, um, the light sheet works. So we're illuminating along that a very thin slice. Whoops and then all of the illuminated light is collected in one go through our imaging detector. So in practice this is how it works. We have this long sheet of light which is effectively a confocal illumination and we then collect any fluorophore illuminated through that sheet onto our camera and we just move the sample through that sheet so it allows you to image very quickly through um, the sample. And we're able to image quite large structures as well through that. So it's very, very little phototoxicity, very quick for a long period of time. So going back to the, the strategy, we can optically section it using confocal or light sheet microscopy. The other technique was this reassigning the light from where it's ended up back to where it came from. So this is using deconvolution as a strategy. So deconvolution is relying on how we know how the system blurred 
that light in the first place. So this refraction of light caused by the environment, the mounting media, the cover slip, the oils it goes through, the lenses inside the objective, the filter sets, the camera lenses, all of these things start to spread the light through the optical system. But if we knew enough about the system, we could use that to mathematically reassign the light back to where it came from. So if we take our sample of point sources and we image it, we get that splaying of the light through Z. But we can use the knowledge of how that happens to try and work out where it came from. So some of the light that ended up here, we know it should have come from here. The light that came from here, we know it should have come from here. And using mathematics through the Huygens software, we can actually get the light back to where it came from. So this isn't just a guesstimation of where the light came from. It's actually using um, iterative deconvolution algorithms to, to reliably reassign the light back to where it came from. But the advantage of this is we're not rejecting light. A confocal rejects light through the pinhole. So the light just doesn't pass through the pinhole if it's from the outer focus planes. In deconvolution, all of the light is reassigned back. So you actually get an increase in signal following deconvolution. So if you've got a weak signal, deconvolution is probably a better strategy than confocal. So we can start off and we acquire a Z stack using a wide field microscope, which you kind of see is all a bit puffy and a bit cloudy. The information's there, it's just kind of getting hidden in the out of focus blur. So it's not background, it's the out of focus blur. Following deconvolution, everything becomes a bit sharper because the light's been put back to the optical slice that it actually came from, not where it imaged ended up. So following deconvolution, this was the raw image. You can see it's all a very good signal, it's, but it's all a bit puffy. Following deconvolution, you can really see the, the fine details that are normally hidden in the blur. So it's actually possible to take a confocal image that you've passed through the pinhole, but has still got some spreading of the light through the optical um, stack, and we can actually deconvolve that after we've imaged it on the confocal. I can see that that still gives an improvement in resolution and signal. Um, so it's not a case of confocal is your only option or deconvolution. We can actually deconvolve confocal data. The third strategy was thin sections or, or wide field. So the histology unit is fantastic at imaging, um, slicing almost any tissue so that you end up with thin ribbons or tissue culture microscope, um, tissue culture cells are also very thin. That mean, if you look down the microscope and the image that you can see by the microscope is the image that you want, you can take a picture of that. You've no need to go on to deconvolution or confocal. If you can see it and it looks good, just take a picture. The wide field microscopes are actually the brightest samples that we, we can image on because you've essentially got 100% of the light going onto the camera. We're not going through hardly any optical surfaces. We're not rejecting light. Um, we're going through the filters onto really sensitive cameras. So you can achieve, achieve fantastic resolution just using the wide field microscopes. If that's what you need and that answers your question, you don't need to go any further. The cheaper than using the confocal, your throughput is much higher than on the confocal or deconvolution. So rather than just acquiring a few images per hour, you could get tens of images per hour on the wide field systems. So thin tissue sections, you can get lots of resolution. So you have to sort of remember that the more complicated a system that you go to, the more data that you're going to acquire. So snapshots are very simple, low amounts of data. You start adding snapshots with different multiple colors 
you're going to increase your data. You then go to a system and you're taking multiple slices in multiple colors and you might then do that over time so your data becomes higher and you can even go onto the a lot of our microscopes allow you to do point visiting over time so you can end up with a huge amount of data by the end of your experiment and you have to remember what are you going to do with all this data you have to then be able to handle that in the image processing and the data analysis and actually move your data around the, the, the building and onto Isilon. So you have to think before you start acquiring huge amounts of data, how are you going to process it? What do you need? What information do you need from your um, images to allow you to answer the question that you were actually trying to answer in the first place? So sometimes we get carried away trying to use the latest and greatest, fanciest microscopes. So in the old days, you'd have a microscope, you'd take a picture down it, and that would answer your question. Now you come along and you put it down a fancy confocal microscope, you ask the question, it's still a mammoth, you know? Did you really need this fancy microscope to answer your question? The simpler the microscope, the easier it is for you to answer the question, the probably still the better the data that you're gonna get off it. Confocals are great for 3D work, but they're also slower and more expensive. People might feel reluctant to use the snapshot microscopes, but actually if you can use them, it's great for screening your samples. And if you look down it and you can see the answer, that's the system that you want. So rather than just saying, I need to use a confocal, come down to the bioimaging facility and say, I need to use a microscope. Which would you recommend? So again, these are the webs, uh, websites that I, I kind of went through um, during the seminar and to learn more about the different microscope types there's some really good resources out there on the on the web so I definitely would suggest visiting these to just browse through and see what, what um, more information you can learn on those systems. Okay thank you very much.